Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 12 through 22. And uh, we're going to preach the gospel this morning. Amen. Amen. It says, uh, this is the Apostle Paul. If you're not familiar, the Colossians is a New Testament book. It's one of the prison epistles, meaning the Apostle Paul was actually imprisoned in Rome when he wrote this letter. And uh, to the church of Colossae, which was one of the churches in kind of the area of Asia Minor. And uh, so just remember, the Apostle Paul's writing from prison. I don't know how you'd feel in prison. I don't know if you'd get caught up in the atmosphere in there and you'd start living like everybody else in prison. Or whether or not you'd still serve the Lord, I don't know. I don't know what I, I mean. I would hope and pray that if I ended up in prison for preaching the gospel, that we'd start a ministry over there. Amen. <laughs> but nevertheless, that's what happened to the Apostle Paul. He was a mighty man of God. And so he writes this letter to the church in Colossae. He says, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, I'm not going to switch back and forth, but if I showed you three other translations, that word meet right there would say qualify. The Lord has made you and I qualified to be partakers, to be joint participators in the inheritance of of the saints in light. Amen. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. And has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I just want to take just a second right there to say. I don't know what you feel like sometimes. Like when you leave this place or at nighttime when you're all alone. I don't know. We sang a song to the youth last night that says. When the night is holding on to me. God is holding on. The night represents darkness, right? And the, and the darkness don't want to let go. The evil spirits don't want to let you go, child of God. But I'm here to tell you what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that you and I, if we truly are believers, have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. In whom, talking about Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God. That's one of the beautiful things about reading the Gospels. When you see Jesus and you see the way he interacts with hum other human beings. And you see the way he interacts with religion. And you see the way that he serves other people. He is a, the physical image. The visible image of the eternal Father. Have you ever wondered how Jesus would handle a situation? I know that little bracelet here. And I'm not, if you got a WWJD bracelet on. You know, I was in, it's kind of funny, I was in the clinic the other day and some girl was being, her and her brother were fighting and she was like real, like she really threw some major shade or roasted her brother, like really gave him a good zinger. And I'm like, he wouldn't do that? And she's like, what you mind? I'm like, that little bracelet. See, I can see everything. I'm looking everywhere. That little bracelet you got on your wrist right there. WWJ, he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't tell your brother just what you just told him. I'm just saying, I'm just being real. And I mean, they were very receptive. We had already talked about the Lord a little bit. But if you ever want to know what the Lord would do, you just go to the Gospels. Yeah, that's right. When, if you want to know how Jesus treated people that treated him wrong, you just go to the Gospels. And you go look at his words when he's hanging naked on the cross after they done beat him and stripped him of everything and, and ridiculed him and mocked him. If you want to know how Jesus handled you just go to the Gospels and you yeah. see the physical representation of the Father. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes or before time alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now has he reconciled. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Hallelujah. Yes, so, you know, for the for this morning, what I want to use, the main verse of scripture that I want to use comes out of this verse 18 right here. 
And what I want to preach to you about is this right here. The head of the body, the church. My title this morning is The Head Controls the Body. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask, Lord, that you would just use me as a vessel, Lord God. Just a, uh, just a vessel, a mouthpiece, that's all I am. Lord, you've put your word on the inside of me. You've led me and guided me, Lord. And these are your people, Lord, the, sh the, the, the sheep of your, uh, your flock, oh, Lord God. And, and you desire to feed your flock, oh, Lord. You desire for your people called by your name to hear your word so that you can do what you desire to do on the inside of them. These aren't, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to be a hireling, Lord, but I'm an under-shepherd. Lord, I'm not the shepherd. You're the shepherd. Lord God, and I pray that you would help me to give your people good grass to eat, Lord God, that they might grow and that they might become strong. Lord, that we might understand that you are the head and that we're the body in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, there's multiple scriptures in the word of God that describe Jesus as the head and, and describe believers as the body of Christ. The words body and church have very similar meanings, you know. But they also, they, they, they describe the people of God, but they also describe the purpose of God's people. And Christ, as the head of the church, has the mind of what is to be done on earth. When he was, when he was on earth, his body did the work, right? His feet walked where ministry was needed. Uh, his, his eyes made contact with those people that needed ministry. His hands touched them. Amen. And he brought healing to them. It didn't matter whether it was a possessed man of Gadarene or a possessed girl of the Syrophoenician mom. It didn't matter if it was a dead girl, Talitha Kumi, come forth. It didn't matter if it was a blind beggar named Bartimaeus that needed sight. It didn't matter if it was a heartbroken divorcee, which was the Samaritan woman. Whoever needed help, he was there to bring healing. His feet brought him where he needed to go. And his eyes saw who needed healing. And his mouth spoke the words of truth. And those healing hands that would one day be pierced would touch them and bring hope. I've got to tell you that the plan of God for his people is that they would be healed from their disease. God wants you and I healed from our disease so that we can function as his body and bring healing to the spiritually sick so that they can have victory on earth and share the hope of what they found with other people. You know, kind of like a little bit of a long story, but I was driving back over here Wednesday night because I had left something at the church and I come down easy street and all of a sudden, boom. I feel something I'm like, dude, what was that in the road? I hit something. So anyway, I get home and I realize I got a flat tire. I'm not going to go into all the details, but it was much worse than all that. But anyway, the end result was is that the next day I go bring my tired brothers. I bring the tired brothers to get a patch, right? Because I saw it looked like a big old nail. Well, they pulled it out. Come to find out, it was a bolt. I think it was about that long. And they said, dude, we got a problem. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, the bolt actually put a pinhole in your rim. So now the tire won't seal up. Okay. Make a long story short, though. I found somebody that's supposedly going to weld it for me. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Kevin Fernandez. I told him, I told Kevin, <laughs> I told him the other day, I said, dude, if you could work your way into heaven, brother, you'd have a first class ticket over there. <laughs> Boom. Got it. Amen. But I think he's a big boy. He can handle it. Nevertheless, on my journey, I ended up going to this other place that does aluminum welding just to see if it would work out. And there, lo and behold, I met the woman who I've told y'all this story before, who was instrumental in the salvation of my sister, Debbie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she recognized me. I didn't recognize her. She's like, Matt? And when she told me who she was, dude, I just went, I started like preach, preaching and witnessing up in the place. And you know why? Because I don't know exactly where she is with the Lord. She sure was happy to talk about the Lord, I can tell you that. But one thing I can tell you is, is that that woman, wherever she's been through these last years, was instrumental in the salvation of me. 
Because, see, the Lord reached in and saved her, and she had a testimony in her mouth whenever my sister showed up that night who was broken and did not know where to go. She was disgusted with life, and all of a sudden, that woman reached over there and grabbed that Bible and said, Hey, did I tell you that Jesus saved me? And my sister got saved, and then she shows up in the house, and she's talking about Jesus. What I'm trying to tell you is this. I was excited to see that woman, church. Because God has changed me. God changed me from a hopeless person. I didn't know. the. Listen, all I know is that I'm just so grateful that the Lord has showed up. And I just want to keep on serving him. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy from each and every one of us in this room this morning. Right. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus is alive and well. And if you'll invite him on the inside of your heart, you watching on Facebook or wherever you are, if you will invite him inside of your heart, if you ask forgiveness of your sin, he will move in. And if you will let him, he will grow on the inside of you and he will heal you. He will heal your disease and he will make a body that can begin to function. Amen. And so, and that's what he wants the body to do. He wants the body to do exactly what that woman did so many years ago. To function as a mouthpiece. To function as hands. To function as feet. We might not all stand behind this sacred desk, church. But guess what? We need to take the truth of the gospel outside of these walls and bring it to the workplace. We need to bring it to the people that we know that are in Walmart. The old friends that we had. And you don't have to stress about telling them. You just let Jesus keep changing you on the inside. And when the time comes, the Spirit will open your mouth and He will give you the words to speak. Amen. He will speak words of hope. He will speak words of victory. He will give you a testimony. If you'll trust in church, Amen. he'll give you a testimony. Well, what kind of testimony is he going to give me, preacher? He delivered you out of darkness. Walk up in here looking all religious. Come on, somebody. Help me out. I'll walk in here. I won't know, preacher. I ain't never done nothing wrong. Come on, man. Come on, man. No. If you let him, he will deliver you out of darkness. Amen. And he'll give you a testimony That's right. yeah. to speak to somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. His body, he wants to bring healing to the spiritually sick so that they can have victory on earth and share the hope of what they found with other people. Well, what is, what is the people's disease? Their disease is the same as all of us. That we were born into darkness. Make no mistake, church, the problem is sin. The problem is sin before you get saved, and the problem is sin after you get saved. Yeah. Yeah. Because, see, the enemy's not going to quit. Yeah. Oh, no, listen, you got to understand, basic New Testament theology says that in Christ, you're forgiven. Hey, hallelujah. In Christ, the, you're unblameable in the sight of the Lord. Because Jesus took your guilt. Amen. And now you're justified in the Lord. But listen, the enemy doesn't quit. He's still going to try to side rail, side rail you. He's still going to try to put the bridge out up ahead and make you take a detour. He's still going to try to get you to travel down a road that's opposite of the will and the direction of God. The, 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 let's not be confused, church. The problem is sin. Born into a world of darkness, separated from the presence of God. But the church is supposed to be different. Amen? Are we not? Yes. The church is supposed to be different. Because the church is his body. Now listen. I want you to know that. The church as his body. This word right here. Ecclesia. That's the word. That's the Greek word for church right there. This word is a two part word. Ek means out. Ecclesia is where we get the word called, and that's what it means, called. So what does that mean? The word church means called out. Called out. Now, what are you trying to say? I mean, the Lord's calling. That's not like that. It's not like a street fight. He's not calling. He called, what is he calling you out of? He's calling you out of darkness. The church was, the, the, the creation was born into a world that is fallen and darkened. That's what the Word of God says. It wasn't created that way. God created Adam out of a lump of clay that came from pristine dirt, my friend. 
When God was done, when God, God created this whole thing to make a habitable place for, for mankind to be able to dwell. And when he pulled Adam out of that clay, that clay wasn't tainted. That clay wasn't polluted. That clay wasn't infected. But then Adam brought sin into himself. And now all the offspring, all of Adam's seed, all of the sons of Adam have gone the way have been born with a sinful nature. And the first time you're born, you're born in sin. When you gush forth in water from your mother's womb, you're already dying when you take your first breath. I know that sounds harsh, but it's just reality. When you take your first breath, how the doctor, I don't know if they still slap them on the bum or not. But when the doctor slaps you on the bum and you take that first breath of air, you start to cry. You're already in the process of death, decay, because the earth is fallen. Yeah. That's why you must be born again. That's why we must be born again. It's a born again spiritually, amen? And that's the disease, born in the darkness. But the Lord has called us out of darkness. Come out from amongst them, says the Lord. Be ye separate. What fellowship does light have with darkness? Amen. The church is the called out ones, amen? He's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that brings me to point number one. I want you to know that a body functions better in the light. Amen? A body functions better in the light. Whether it's proper lighting to be able to see to work, or sunlight to convert vitamin D, the body needs light. And spiritually, it's the same thing. Amen? Spiritually, it's the same thing. The body works better in the light. I just want you to know. And the Lord wants to give us his light through the word of God. He wants to train us up. He wants more and more light to come Amen. into our hearts and our lives because he wants to heal us from this disease of darkness. But I got to tell you something. You know, if I was going to give you a point number two, it would be that Saint, Satan wants you in the dark. Satan wants you in the dark away from the healing. See, if the light is healing, like sunlight creates vitamin D and increases your immune system. If the light of the gospel is healing like medicine for your bones, if I could say it like that, then the enemy wants to keep you in the dark and keep you away from the healing that God wants to produce in your life. The church must know the problem is sin, which results in darkness, making us, the body, spiritually sick. And a sick body can't function properly. Amen? Amen. A sick body can't function properly microscopically, meaning individually, and it can't function macroscopically, meaning on a grand or global scale. Just like the song saying, I'm a living stone and in this house I will grow. The living stone is you as the individual part. And you're being constructed on the foundation, which is Christ. And he's building a place where his spirit can live. Yes, his spirit lives in you, but you're part of the bigger whole of what is the church. And so the whole thing's supposed to be alive. And it's supposed to be functioning as an organism together in unity. That's why it's so important that we preach the truth of the gospel and that we don't get caught up. I'm about to get there. And all the foolishness that that's going on in the modern church today. Amen. Paul said, I would that we would speak the same thing. Yeah. What are we going to speak, Paul? The message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. The medicine for your broken body. The only thing that will heal you in your heart and in your mind and in your spirit, man. The only thing that will wipe away the bitterness from what other people have done in your life. The only thing that can truly heal you and make you whole. So the church needs to know that the problem is sin. And a sick body can't function microscopically or macroscopically. In John 8, 32, this is what Jesus said. He said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I want you to know that the light is truth. I want you to know that Jesus is the light and that Jesus is the truth. I want you to know Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. Hallelujah. No man comes unto the Father but by me. I want you to know that Jesus is the focal point. I want you to know that any message that doesn't lift up Jesus and exalt Jesus is a lying message. I want you to know any song that sings about something other than the glory of Jesus or what Jesus has done or what God has done to heal this earth is some kind of another song that might not belong in the church. 
But the church is filled with different kinds of songs, and different kind of preachers, and different kind of sermons that sound like it might be the right thing because they might mention his name, but they're not telling you the truth. And it's so tricky, yeah. and it leads into yeah. darkness, and it moves you away from healing, and your sick body doesn't get better. Throughout Israel's history, she had false prophets that would tell her lies. Now, if you read the Bible, that's what you'll learn. I want to encourage you to read the Bible, by the way. I want to encourage you to study the Bible for yourself. If you Listen, even if you don't feel like you have time, get it on audio, man. Yeah, stick, yeah. That, stick it in there and just let it run That's to right. where you can hear it, to where you can start becoming familiar yeah. with the characters. Yeah. Get it in you. Do some homework. Right. I just want to encourage you. I'm not, I'm not trying to jab you. Maybe a little bit. I'm trying to like light a fire. <laughs> Amen? I try. I try to study really, really hard, and I've been praying, Lord, please help me to communicate it in a way where it's not overdone get the point across but at the same time as much as i can try i can i'm all, i can only do so much the lord can make it a lot for you but you but we got to do some work friend amen i mean if this story's real i'm just saying I, and i witness this way to people all the time i'm like dude if this story is real about the lord i know it is but they the people i talk to they're not convinced if conjunction Coordinating conjunction, I believe it is. If this story is real, comma, we should be working a whole lot harder and being a whole lot more concerned about our eternal soul than what any of us on this earth are, including the preacher right now. Dude, this ain't some kind of play game. That's right. It this ain't like some kind of facade, like some kind of movie that we in and it's not reality. No, according to the word of God, this is what reality is. Everything else is a figment of our imagination. All this other stuff that's going on around us is peripheral. He's the focal point. He's the truth. This is our whole purpose upon this earth. What will you do with the son is the question that the father wants to ask. Amen. If we're, if, and if that's not it, then I don't need, what are we even doing here? Am I being real? Or are we just coming for a social gathering? Give some people some punt and knuckle bumps. Hey, man, I haven't seen you in a while. Been kind of lonely. Got some friends at the church. And look, we can be that for one another, body of Christ. Amen. We're talking about the truth right now. Throughout Israel's history, the prophets lied. And they told the people that everything was going to be fine. Everything's fine. And the Lord's like, that. okay, let's just go ahead and read one. <laughs> let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 23. And I'm going to go ahead and go over to the NASB right here. But look, let me just tell you something. I've always been about the King James Bible. And, and I still am all about the King James Bible. And I'm not trying to switch gears on you. Okay? I'm not trying to confuse you. If you want to know why I'm all about the King James Bible, you need to go back and you need to watch a six-hour video. And Danielle, maybe we can put that on our website again to remind the people a lamp in the dark. <clears throat> It's a very entertaining thing, but it'll explain to you in detail why your preacher likes the King James Bible. But a big, because it has to do with the original manuscripts, okay? But a big part of what I'm all about is I only want to study and, and, and give you information out of a literal translation. So every now and then I'll use other translations to look because it's got newer English and it helps us to understand some things. But I don't ever use a newer translation without comparing it back to the King James Bible. Amen. That's right. All right, this is the NASB. I like the NASB. It's a literal translation. And so this is talking about Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah the prophet. Now, let me just give you a little quick history on where Jeremiah is in the scheme of things. The nation of Israel has come out of the exodus of Egypt. Just like, and I know I always say it, but I want you to, I want you to remember it. Egypt is a type of the world. Pharaoh is a type of the devil. You were born into the world. You were under the bondage of Pharaoh. God saved Israel through a Passover lamb on the Passover night. How did he do that? He, he told them to kill an innocent as sacrifice to take its blood to paint it on the doorpost and the side post of the door and he said when i see the blood i will pass over you judgment will not fall upon you judgment will fall upon the rest of the world if you can't get a better picture of the gospel 1450 bc before jesus was born then you find a better one and you let me know god's writing the story my friend 
And on that Passover night, God delivered his people Israel, God delivered his people Christian out from the bondage of the Egyptian world, out from the bondage of the world, set, brought them through the Red Sea, a type of baptism, and, and plans to bring them into the promised land where they can have victory, where they can inhabit the land, and they can have victory in the land so that according to Deuteronomy 4 and 5, 8, that the people around them would know what other people are on there on this earth that have their God so close unto them as you would have your God so close unto you that has his word so near unto your heart. See, that's God's plans for Israel. That they'd be a light in the midst of darkness. That they would function like a body. That corporately, the nation and you and I individually making up a whole. That's the God's plan. That his people called by his name would function as a body to reveal his glory to a world that's full of darkness. But when the body's sick, the body can't function. Yeah. And Israel, during the time frame of the kings, what did they do? They started worshiping false gods. And the prophets told them that everything they were doing was fine. Mm -hmm. Things are happening. The people are going into captivity. Other nations are conquering them. And now they're, now they're finding themselves slaves again like they were in Egypt. And the prophet, oh no, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. Everything's going to be fine. What are you talking about? And, and the people think that they're still living for God, but they're actually being told to worship Baal. And what I'm here to tell you is, and before we get started real good, I'm concerned that much of what's going on in the modern church is not really serving the Lord at all. If you read in Corinthians, the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, I am concerned that he may come he said, I'm concerned that just as Eve was led astray through the subtlety of the serpent, that you too might be deceived. For if he, who's he? A minister that claims he's a minister of light. If you read the letter, if you read the chapter 11, you'll see. I'm concerned that if he comes preaching another Jesus. Now this is, that's New Testament, my friend. Another Jesus with another spirit that it's a whole other gospel and you might put up with it. Because you've been deceived, just like the... And what I'm here to tell you is, this little old fella from South Louisiana, who probably people don't... Know, what does this guy know? Come on, man. This is, he's, a, he's a Cajun dude. What do Cajun people know? I mean, the rest of the world saying this big old thing that we call the church is the church. And they got thousands of people, and they got golden candelabra chandeliers, and they got golden chairs, and they sit up on the stage, and they got all this money, and they drive their cars. And I even saw the owner of TBN one time at a concert. The woman, I did, I saw her. I went to a third day concert at Disney, and there she was with her two bodyguards with their mullets. Standing there, I mean, I used to sport a mullet back in the day, so I'm not clowning them too hard. But my point is, is that it's all a facade, man. Yep. It's not reality. Dude, you, you put on TV, I didn't even plan to go here, but it's false prophets. You put on TV and you listen to some of the stuff, and if you start digging down into what these people believe, people are like, man, you're going to touch the anointed, we ain't even close to the anointed. Amen. If it's an anointing, it's not the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Because they're telling people that it's, that it's the ways of the Lord and it's not the ways of the Lord. It's the same spirit. You think that the devil took a vacation? <laughs> if he was working in Israel of Old Testament times, you think he's taking a vacation in the modern church? No, my friend, he's here. Amen. And he's hiding himself. That's why it's called Mystery Babylon. And he disguises himself and he puts on a different costume every week. <laughs> And he reinvents himself. And people are deceived and they fall in. But look, let's see what he says. This is what the Lord says through the prophet Jeremiah right here. He says, woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. I put some notes in here and I just wanted to kind of read them to you. We must understand something that there has been an atmospheric change in the church even since I got saved. I was sharing this with some of the kids last night. I told him, I said, one day Pastor Matt's going to be dead and your parents might be dead too. And all I can tell you is I had a Bible under here. I said, this is your map quest, my friend. This is your map quest. And it's the only thing that will get you back home. Yeah, that's right. So whenever I know that some of the people that were here last night, that, that their parents believe that the Bible is the word of the living God. 
And I made them repeat it, at least in their head. Literal translation. Find you, if you find yourself lost one day and you don't know how to get home, clicking two red slippers together isn't going to get you home. It's only the word of the living God. You need to find it. It's a map quest. It'll get you back home, my friend. Amen. Amen. But there's things that are changing in the church, and it's changed so much just since I got saved. I've been around long enough to at least notice. Some of you in here, y'all noticed it too. When I got saved, we were taught and we understood that there was a spiritual realm out there. There are evil spirits that want to destroy us with lies, and there's the Holy Spirit that wants to heal us with truth. As you will see in this passage as we move forward, it's evil spirits, not God, that puts lies into the mouths of God's priests and prophets. What should have been healing balm, truth, became a bitter curse. We need to understand that the enemy has been doing the same. The word of faith movement, the seeker sensitive movement, the hyper charismatic church tells the people of God lies that prevent them from being healed. I'm about to break it down. The word of faith says don't confess that you have sin because then you will become sin conscious instead of God conscious. That's Joseph Prince. That's, their, that's, their, that's the pretty boy on TBN that everybody flocks to. And much of what he says sounds like it's right because he talks about faith and he talks about righteousness. But if you read his book, and I saw it with my own eyes, I didn't read the whole book, but I found enough to, to say what I'm about to say. Don't admit that you got sin because then you become sin conscious. It's that no, 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 no. The first step is to admit that there's a sin problem and to understand that there's healing bone. And from Gilead, hallelujah. And his name is Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. That's a lie. That's the pro that is propo proposing a lie. Then, then, then you got then you got the uh, the seeker sensitive folk. I'm sorry. Let, let's go next to the to the hyper charismatic church. And listen, I've been in some of this. I'm all about the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit, my friend. I believe that the Lord will slay, slay, like, knock people down if that's what he chooses to do. But, but can I just, can you just reason with me just for a second? Can we just talk real? Just kind of break it down a little bit. We don't need to be formal. We're a small church. All right. Can you show me one time in the New Testament where people are falling out under the presence of the Lord? I can tell you one time that I've seen. One time. Now, and if I'm wrong, you tell me because I'm just shooting from the hip. The one time that I see people falling out under the power of God in the New Testament is whenever they came to arrest Jesus in the corner. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Whom do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. I am. Boom. They all fall down on the ground. Mm -hmm. You Okay. I can tell you of one time I know in the Old Testament that it was legit. The dedication of Solomon's temple. This presence of God was so thick that the priest could no longer stand. You're going to bow down and reverence. So I don't have a problem with it, but how all of a sudden in this hyper-charismatic church, we, don't, we ain't had church unless people were falling out all over the ground. And we ain't got nothing in the New Testament to tell us that we should be seeing this as the signs of a move of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. right. And not only that, they go to jerking and shaking. You can go turn on some videos of Kenneth Copeland and some of these other guys in the past, and they're literally crawling around on the ground barking like a dog. Anybody ever see that being a sign that the Holy Spirit, other than the Holy Spirit is casting something out of somebody? <laughs> and they're, they're receiving deliverance? I'm not trying to pick on nobody. I'm just trying to think. <laughs> I'm just trying to use the brain that the good Lord gave me and compare it to the scripture and to find out what is the truth, what is a move of the spirit, how does the truth minister to somebody. See, what I see in the Bible, listen to me, a move of the spirit, I see people getting baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking with other yes. tongues. I see the gifts of the spirit moving and operating in the church where somebody give a word in tongues, somebody have an interpretation of the tongue. I believe that I see in the word of God that sometimes God does give us Words of knowledge and words of prophecy. But listen to me. You think that the enemy can't use false prophets to also give words? But then whenever that happens, it's not even a gift of the spirit anymore. It's what you call clairvoyance. It's called a demon spirit speaking just like he did in the woman that had the spirit of divination. And, and we see all of these. And this is what our services are all about now. 
See, if they're not preaching the truth of the gospel, how can we trust that the move of the spirit that we're seeing is really a move of the Holy Spirit and not a new, not a move of another spirit? See, I'm, I'm concerned, like Paul said, that just as that Eve was deceived by the serpent through his subtlety, that you might be removed from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. For if he cometh preaching another Jesus, it's got another spirit. It's a whole nother gospel. Yeah. And you might put up with it. And here's the children of Israel. See, what should have been in the seeker-sensitive church. Oh, don't let me forget them. Let me pick on them a little bit. <laughs> the seeker-sensitive church says, don't talk about sin, cross, blood, because you will offend people and they won't be comfortable in the church and they won't want to come back to your church. And instead, what they're going to do is they're going to come to a church like ours because there's a paradigm shift. Y'all remember that? Yeah. Did anybody raise your hand if you remember the word paradigm shift? Yep. Thank you. We got some people in the church that old enough in the, in the faith to remember. That was about eight, ten years ago. There's a, there's a change coming. There's a paradigm shift coming. What does a paradigm shift mean? It means a change in the order of the way we do things. It changed. It changed. And now we got to make sure that we say all the politically correct words because we don't want to offend anybody. Can I tell you a little secret? The Holy Spirit convicts people where there's areas of their life that aren't right. <laughs> Newsflash. I mean, I'm not trying to be rude. Lord, forgive me if I come across as rude because I don't want to be rude. I don't want to misrepresent the Lord. But newsflash. The Holy Spirit convicts from the preacher to the people. <laughs> He shows us through the word of God and through the Holy Spirit, the areas of our life that aren't right. And he wants it to be corrected because he wants to heal the body. Amen. But in a secret sensitive, you know, I talked about it last night. I talked about it last night in the message. It says he multiplied the fish and the bread and he filled their bellies and they came seeking Jesus. And that's what the secret sensitive movement would say. There's people seeking, so we need to be sensitive to them. Well, the problem that I have with that is, what about being sensitive to the Savior? What about being sensitive to the Spirit? We're going to be sensitive to the seeker? Or, or, or are we going to... I could go on and on. Lord, help me to stay focused. Are we becoming more sensitive to the seeker than we are the Savior and the Spirit? Wait, what? You're becoming more sensitive to the seeker? What about the Savior? What about the Spirit? How about we be Spirit sensitive or Savior sensitive? And how would we do that? We would learn this and stay close to this. Talking about the Word of God. Amen? That's how we would be sensitive to God. If God, listen, if you watch a lamp in the dark, you know what you'll see? Six hours of people that gave their lives to the gospel. I'm talking about William Tyndale burned at the stake. Burned at the stake. Because he refused to submit himself to the authorities because he stood on what the word of God said. In order for the gospel to continue to live. So that you and I, in comfortable America, can have as many Bibles as we want in any way that we want to crack them open to read them at any time. So here's the Lord through Jeremiah. He says that the prophets... Are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who are tending my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not attended to them. Behold, I'm about to attend to you. <laughs> For the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord, then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them. You know, you need to understand something. That sometimes we open up doors to things that we didn't even realize or we knew what we were doing and we weren't supposed to. Guess what? That's what Israel had done. They opened up doors to sin. The Lord had driven them to another place. But he promises he's going to bring them back. If you find yourself in another place, don't be blaming God. You need to look backwards and remember where you opened up that door. And you need to repent. We need to repent. And we need to ask God, Lord, close the door and bring me back. I want to come home now. Amen? 
Then I will bring them back to their pasture and they will be fruitful and multiply. Praise God. I will also raise up shepherds over them and they will tend them and they will not be afraid any longer nor be terrified. Nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. Hallelujah. You know, he's talking about right there. He's about Jesus. You know who David is? King David. This is after King David. This Jeremiah is about 520 B.C. or 580 B.C. King David was 1000 B.C. They, all, they were expecting a king from David to come. And the Lord says, I will raise up, raise up for David a righteous branch and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. I wish I could bring you to Isaiah, but I don't have time. Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2. And he says, out of a stump from Jesse, Jesse was David's daddy. Out of a stump from Jesse, there will be a branch that sprouts up. Oh, hallelujah. You imagine, you see how the enemy would like to cut down the tree of the Lord and there ain't nothing but an old stump left. But guess what? One day you walk out there and there's a little twig sticking out. Hallelujah. Jesus came into this darkened world and, oh, it's turned into a big old tree, my friend. It's turned into a big old tree and it's producing fruit because God's work is a supernatural work. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell securely in this, his name, by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they will no longer say as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt? Didn't I tell you that the Lord delivered you out of Egypt? Amen. But as the Lord lives, see that because he's talking about the past. When they first got saved, if we could say it that way. But he, but he said, instead of them saying that, he's going to say, who brought up and led the descendants of the household of Israel back from the north land? If you don't know the history of the children of Israel, he's talking about because of their disobedience, he allowed their enemies in the north to now take them under bondage. Meaning, back in the day I delivered them out of Egypt. They're not going to just remember me as the God that delivered them out of Egypt. They're not just going to remember me as the Lord that saved their soul. But instead they're going to remember me as the God that brought them back from the land of the north. When after they were my children and they transgressed my ways. And they went in their own direction. And they found themselves under the bondage of the enemy again. And they were in the midst of darkness. And they were being diseased. And they couldn't be free but then I showed up with my life and I healed them and I delivered them that's how they're going to know me now they're going to know me even better than they did back in the old days they're going to know me Christian you're going to know him we're going to know him when he begins to deliver us and bring healing to our bodies and he makes us whole we're going to know him better than we did when we left Egypt we're going to know him so good, so much better when we get to leave Babylon, when we get to leave Assyria, the north land, because of our own captivity. And from the countries where I had driven them, then they will live on their own soil. Hallelujah. I want to go home, Lord. I want to go home. The homeland. I can remember I was just a little kid, 10 years old, flew back. Flew back from, uh, from Singapore, living over there 16 months, and I can remember... Getting off the plane, I reached down <coughs> in Hawaii, Honolulu, Hawaii. I reached down and I kissed the ground. I'm like, what's wrong with you, boy? Yeah, I'm, glad, I'm glad to be home, daddy. Walked in the airport and what is the first thing I saw? A bag of Lay's potato chips. I don't know how old y'all are, but Lay's used to have so there wasn't a bunch of potato chips back in the day when I was 10. Lay's was famous, man. And they had like a little checkerboard to Lay's potato chips. Oh, I'm home. Let me kiss the ground that we walk on. I'm not talking about America right here. I'm talking about the land of the free and the home of the brave. I'm talking about a banner, but it's Jehovah Nisi, the banner of our righteousness. The banner of right, the Lord our righteousness on this soil right here where, where God gives freedom and liberty, hallelujah, where we can walk and be a healed body for the Lord. Yes. As for the prophets, this is the prophet Jeremiah. As for the prophets, my heart is broken within me. All my bones tremble. I have become like a drunken man, even like a man overcome with wine because of the Lord and because of his holy words. For the land is full of adulterers. For the land mourns because of the curse. The pastures of the wilderness have dried up. Their course is also evil and their might is not right. See, I don't know if you do this, but when I read the word of God, sometimes I get images in my mind. And if I can help you... I don't know if you ever saw the movie Pearl Harbor, but you've seen war movies and stuff, right? And I get the impression of, of Jeremiah, the prophet, walking 
in the midst of a war torn town. Buildings are torn down. And, and, and the bombs are still landing. And he's just in the middle of the street. Everybody else is like trying to hide for their life. And he's, he's like, a, he's shell shocked. He's like a drunken man. Because he looks around and there's destruction and there's devastation everywhere. And he's just like stumbling around and the bombs of the enemy are still exploding and causing destruction and causing devastation. And, 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 and again, he's like, I'm like a drunken man. I don't even believe what, what it is that I see. The devastation that the enemy is causing. Everything is drying up around me. <coughs> For both the prophet and the priest are polluted. Even in my house I have found their wickedness, declares the Lord. Therefore they will be like slippery paths to them. They will be driven away into the gloom and fall down in it. For I will bring calamity upon them. The year of their punishment, declares the Lord. Among the prophets of Samaria I saw an offensive thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. Also among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen a horrible thing, the committing of adultery and walking in falsehood. And they strengthen the hands of the evildoers so that no one has turned back from his wickedness. How are people going to turn around if they're hearing lies? All of them have become to me like Sodom and her inhabitants like Gomorrah. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, behold, I'm going to feed them wormwood and make them drink poisonous water. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, pollution has gone forth into all the land. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. That would be the Lord would tell you that about some of the stuff on TV today. I'm not going to sit here and list off a whole bunch of names. But listen to me, you better learn the word of God for yourself so that you can recognize the counterfeit from the truth. That's right. This is what the Lord said. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. <coughs> they speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord has said you will have peace. And as for everyone, how are we going to think that the Lord, listen, I've had some relationships with some people in the last couple of years. And like, man, the Lord is blessing me. The hand of the Lord is blessing me. And I'm like, dude, you just shared with me all your corruption that got this money in your pocket. Besides the wad of money you got in your pocket, you got some other instruments in there that prove evidentially that you done got this through corrupt means. And you're going to tell me God's blessing that? No, sir. No, ma'am, that's not the blessing of the Lord. That's a lie. It's a lie from the enemy that's trying to convince you that it's okay to continue down the path that you are. No, let us not be confused, child of God. The difference between the blessings of the Lord and the blessings of the enemy. Because the enemy can bring blessings too. He just wants a little compromise. He just wants a little compromise. That's all he wants. Everyone who walks in the stubbornness of his own heart, they say calamity will not come upon you. But who has stood in the counsel of the Lord that he should see and hear his word? Who has given heed to his word and listened? Behold, the storm of the Lord has gone forth in wrath. Even a whirling tempest that will swirl down on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has performed and carried out the purposes of his heart. In the last days you will clearly understand it. I did not send these prophets, but they ran to you anyway. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have announced my words to my people and would have turned them back from their evil way and from their evil deeds. The prophets were speaking lies. When God's people are fed lies instead of truth, they consume poison, pollution, false words, and false doctrine as though it were their daily medicine and his body remains Sick In Isaiah chapter 1, he said the body is sick. The mind is sick. How will it be healed? I'm here to tell you this morning, God heals, church. <laughs> I know it's been negative. But let me just, you got, sometimes you got to give the bad before you give the good. I want you to know, many of you sitting in here already know what I'm about to tell you. God heals. God restores. God gives resurrection life. Amen. And that's point number three. He is the God that healeth. 
For sake of time, Exodus 15, 26 says this, and said, if you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord that heals you. Psalm 107, verse 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. I want to tell you that he wants to heal our heart, our minds, our bodies. Before the cross, he told his disciples there would be a change. Amen? The change was the Holy Spirit. Before his death, the Holy Spirit lived with the people of God. After his death, the Holy Spirit lives in the people of God. He responds by faith. What better medicine could a person need than God living on the inside of them? Amen. Is there a better medicine to have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us? He died, resurrected, and ascended. And when he went up, the Holy Spirit came down. Amen. And faith in the truth changes everything. The Spirit of God moves in and that lifeless part of the body becomes alive with energy and power from the Holy Spirit in order to be able to become a part of the body of Christ. Now, I've got to tell you that he heals through truth. When the body is sick, it can't function. In order for a sick body to be healed, it has to have the right mass. The truth, not lies. The real thing, not a placebo. You know what a placebo is? It's a fake thing. They do a trial study on medicine, and then they give 10, they give 100 people the real thing, they give 100 people something like some sugar water. And they see if there's any really statistical change. You can't give somebody something fake and expect it to work. Let's go to Ephesians real quick. I'm about to close up for you. Ephesians 4. <laughs> Verse 11. It says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. One translation says for the equipping of the saints. Why? To do the work of the ministry. Right. To edify or build up the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You know what it's saying? He's saying he wants us to look more like Jesus. That's what he gave apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to tell the truth to the church, to the body of Christ, so that they could be built up, so that they could understand the truth, that they could be healed, so that they could do the work of the ministry. That's what it said. Now listen, I want to hustle up, but nowadays in many churches, they try to say that the work of the ministry is somebody working in nursery, somebody working in children's ministry, somebody being in music ministry. Don't get me wrong. We need that. As a matter of fact, we need help. I'm going to be real. We're, and, and, and it's possible in the future we might need more help. Whether it's with children, whether it's in nursery, we need help. And if people, I, I didn't do this, I didn't plan to do this as a plug for help. But if people would step up and get put on a schedule, then people would have to do less work. Right now, we've probably got about six people in the church that do the majority of everything that we do. With all that said, that's just how we're going to function when we have our two services a week so that we can preach the truth, so that we can grow in the knowledge of the Lord, so that we can be built up, so that we can be healed, so that we can take the ministry that God's put in us, take it on the outside, and give it to other people because that's really what God's calling us to do. But he says this, that we would henceforth, see, because look what it says right here. This is about truth again. The unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we would no more be like children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, meaning false doctrine will make you like a wave on the ocean going this way, then going that way, and you'd be like lost. You don't have a GPS, you're just all over the place. Something new rises up in the church. Oh, let's go see that. Oh, look, they got signs and wonders over there. Oh, let's go over here. Oh, this is the answer that I need. That's the, no, no, no. The answer that you need is right here in the book. That's right. Amen. You just got to surrender to it. From the slight of man and cunning craftiness, 
but speaking the truth in love that we might all grow up or become a mature man in him, all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. That's a whole lot of words, but you know what it says? Every joint. Pinky, I said it when we got started, the pinky's connected to the hand. And so it's kind of like if I was a pinky and Mike was a ring finger and Chari was a, a middle finger, there's no pun intended, and somebody else was a pointy finger and somebody else was a thumb and now the hand <coughs> can grab something, right? And, and then somebody else, Brendan was an eye, Kate was an eye, now, now we can see. And, and, then, and then the next thing you know, Devin was a foot, Vince was a foot. Now the body can walk, oh, hallelujah. And somebody else was an arm, I don't know. And now Rich can play the guitar. And, and then, you know, and, and, and somebody, Yvette got a voice, Yvette can sing, oh, we got, and Chris got a finger too. And he can sit back there and he can click on the computer, hallelujah. And Hannah and, and Manuel got a voice too, and they can teach the kids. And Manny can put my new TV up here when he got a chance. And you know, all these things, things are working now, man. Hallelujah, we're getting some stuff done. We can't just be, because look, I can't even screw that. Well, I might be able to. It don't look that difficult. Maybe I'll try to tackle that. But the point is, you get what I'm saying? There's little pieces that are working together and they're forming the body and every piece is important. Even if you're just showing up at church, hallelujah, so that we got somebody to preach to. It gets weird, dude, when there's like five people. Maybe if I would preach less long, you would show up. All right. Well, let's go ahead and see if we can finish this. Music singers, musicians, y'all can come up because I'm not going to preach the rest. All right. Going back to Colossians. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness shall dwell, that he made peace through the blood of his cross. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were alienated. Can you imagine a piece of the body cut off? And separated from the rest of the body. It doesn't have a blood flow. What's it going to happen to it if you put a tourniquet on this? All this stuff down here is going to turn purple and die. Just like if you lop a branch off a tree, it's going to wither up and dry up. Amen. But see, you used to be alienated. You used to be separated. But when you got saved, poof, he stuck you in the tree. Now you're receiving the life force of the Holy Ghost. Right? But you used to be enemies in your mind. But now you've been reconciled in the body of his flesh. His flesh. That's really the medicine we needed. Was his flesh. To die for us through death. To present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in the sight of the Lord. I just want to encourage you this morning as I'm closing. I'm going to ask them to sing a song. And we're going to worship the Lord together. Amen. As we leave. I just want you to remember that the Lord has called you. He's called you to be a body part. He's called you to be a lively stuff. A part of a bigger, bigger purpose. Amen? Amen? And we all have a function. I want to encourage you. We all have a function. And listen, some of you, I know y'all are from Cutoff and other places down the road, and you're driving a long distance. There were times that I would come back to church and I would tell my pastor, dude, I prayed with somebody today. He's like, man, we need to move you to Franklin. I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, so after you pray with him, you can bring him to the church. I ain't like that. I'm not like that. If the people you minister to down the body don't ever come up in this church, I'm so excited that you took the Jesus that we talk about in this place and you brought him out there. Because we're building the Lord's kingdom. We're not building this one. And if we'll pay attention to the Lord's business, guess what? He'll fill this one up. Hallelujah. Let's just work together in the kingdom of the Lord. Let us let him heal us. So that we can function for him. If you need prayer, the altars are open. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen.